Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our second webinar in our webinar and workshop series on better vaccine conversations. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, wait just a minute to see if we have anyone else join us before getting started. And uh, then we'll jump into the presentation. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, at home, at work, and in uh, virtual meeting spaces like this one, Alaskans are tackling challenging conversations about the COVID-19 vaccine. And whether it's because we're figuring out how to come back to the office or navigating childcare, uh, planning family gatherings, or talking about vacations, um, our conversations about vaccination provoke powerful feelings about safety, health, freedom, autonomy, and our responsibility to one another and the communities that we care for. So it's really easy for conversations like these to become heated and high conflict very quickly. Things like faulty assumptions and loaded words can push our relationships into a really vicious cycle of defensiveness and mistrust, hostility. And so um, a lot of times we come in with one conversation goal, like um, making a particular decision about a policy in the case of a professional environment or about uh, a uh, about a visit or a vaccination decision ourselves um, when we're talking with family or friends. And uh, we end up really frustrated at the end. And so what we're going to be discussing today is why we need to redefine our goals when we're entering into these conversations. How can we do better than we're doing right now? So, um, Today, move to the next slide. Um, we're going to be focusing on why our conversations tend to fail, uh, at least by the from the outlook of the goals that we've set. Uh, how influence really works, and alternative goals that we might have for conversations going in. Then we'll explore the upcoming uh, webinars and workshops that we're going to be having, and we'll go into a Q&A. And just to set your expectations appropriately, um, we are really going to be focusing on the why we need to redefine our conversation goals uh, and not the, like it, once we've made the decision that we need to shift our goals, it can be really, really hard to stay committed to those new goals and it can be really hard to achieve them. And one hour webinar is not going to be an opportunity to go that deep. Um, we're just going to be talking about why it might be a good idea to change the goals that you have in mind. Uh, and then we'll have a workshop this upcoming Thursday that's going to go much deeper into the specific skills that you might use to actually achieve those new goals. So with that, um, some of you uh, may be familiar with the Alaska Humanities Forum. Uh, we developed this series in partnership with the Alaska Children's Trust with funding from United Way and the Municipality of Anchorage's Health Department. A quick caveat, uh, the opinions, findings, and recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the Alaska Humanities Forum. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the United Way of Anchorage or the Municipality of Anchorage's Health Department. Uh, like I said, some of you may be familiar with our work. For those of you who aren't, we're just going to share a short two minute video to help you get a little bit of context for who we are and how we think about the work of strengthening communities. Here it is.
The world is so fast paced now that there's not a lot of space to just sit and actually listen. The problems that we face aren't simple. They're layered, they're nuanced. We get in a silos of people who think like us. And that's what we often ignore. We try to solve problems in a technical way. We try to work around humans and tackle really complex issues. But at the heart of the issue and at the heart of the solution is people. One of the ways that we can build community is through stories. And at the Humanities Forum, what we do with those stories is we use them as our tool. The tool to connect people, a tool to bridge differences. If you really want to strengthen communities, you have to tackle relationships. We play the role of convening, of creating that space. A place where people and ideas could come together. To talk about and work on the issues that are most important in our community. Conversations that are actually thought-provoking and that matter. Imagine if we could work through those things. The value is bringing such diversity together. You share values or views of the world. If you step away from what you think you're supposed to say in a conversation, you just can't help but have your ideas be um, influenced and informed by other people's ideas. Open up your mind, and that's how you really connect with people. It opens us up to be interested in why people are the way they are. Shared experiences create relationships, and those relationships are what solutions are built on. And relationships aren't something short term. You cannot make community in a single quarter of a single year. Our work is all about the long game. I think that's really what's going to change our communities. It sounds soft, but it's not. It changes the path to what's possible. It's the work that can actually change societies. You start to think about future generations and what their experience is going to be. We have the opportunity now to change history. We do, and I think we're going to do it. Then let's have a conversation. What do we want to build? Okay, so that's the Alaska Humanities Forum. And um, my name is Megan Cassiola. I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Forum. Uh, I've been at the Forum for about uh, almost eight years now. And uh, a big focus of our work uh, is hosting and, um, and facilitating conversations that matter. And so that's why we also help um, provide workshops and trainings on how to help other people have conversations that are difficult or challenging or just the kind of conversation that we tend to avoid. Um, but that if we can uh, come together and confront those conversations, we're stronger together as a community. I'm here with my colleague, Aud Odd Plez, our workshop coordinator. And um, Odd, you, you've probably seen their emails uh, in order to access this workshop. Uh, they're putting their uh, contact information into the chat in case you have any sort of technical issues um, throughout this presentation. So that, there we go. Uh, Ad and I also want to acknowledge that we're facilitating from J. Yatenu, Anchorage, the current and ancestral homelands of the Dena'ina people. Uh, this, uh, this sculpture here is down by Ship Creek, right by our offices at the train station. We're both facilitating from home because we have a pretty jam-packed internet, or wait, no, actually Odd is facilitating from the office. So Odd is there, I'm facilitating from home, but our internet connection is pretty jam-packed and so uh, so that's why we're in separate locations right now um, but the um, the this sculpture here is by Joel Isaac and um, it honors the um, the 
the fish camps that um, happen at Ship Creek um, and have happened for many, many hundreds of years. And so um, with that, the goals of this particular webinar, um, we went through this a little bit in the agenda, but first we're going to talk about why our typical conversation goals fail. And then we'll understand how influence actually works. I mean, typically when we are having conversations about uh, vaccination, we're hoping that we're going to influence people. And so um, our second um, piece is to just learn a little bit more about how influence does tend to function. And then finally, we'll talk about some alternative goals that you might have. And like I shared at the beginning of this presentation, just to set expectations, I want to acknowledge that actually committing for the long haul to those new goals and achieving them is really, really difficult. And those skills are not within the scope of this hour long webinar. Um, but that being said, we do have a workshop that's going to be coming up this Thursday where we'll talk about those in much more detail and actually practice them. So uh, I recommend that if you're interested in getting more, uh, if going a little bit deeper with this topic after this webinar that um, you sign up for that. So just to set the context um, of why we even get into conversations around the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, uh, there's, there's a wide variety of stakes that we might have within a conversation. Some conversations are much, much higher stakes than other conversations. And that shifts how difficult those conversations can be and how well we are able to actually um, adhere to new conversation goals. But I want to acknowledge all of these and we'll talk about them in more detail as we continue through the presentation. So, you know, there's the abstract conversations that we might have. And so that might be um, two vaccinated people who are arguing about whether or not a vaccine mandate is a good idea. Uh, for all practical purposes, they are, you know, both vaccinated, they may have very strong um, distinctions and beliefs around a mandate, but, uh, but fundamentally they're having a conversation that doesn't necessarily bear on a specific decision that they have control over themselves. Another would be um, an organization is deciding whether to require youth to be vaccinated to participate in their programming. Uh, you might be a, a stakeholder in an organization, whether you're a, a staff member or a board member, uh, or even just a community member who um, often participates, a parent of a student. And, um, and as part of that decision-making process, there's a conversation that is happening uh, that may or may not really bear directly on your day-to-day -day life. And then you, you keep on going deeper with the stakes. You know, you might have a family that's arguing about whether to visit their unvaccinated family members. And so you have a lot of um, questions about, uh, you know, the relationships that are there in that family and how they'll be affected by, like, really truly affected by the, the decision that's being made here and um, also potential health consequences. And then, you know, an even higher stakes, I mean, one of the most high stakes decision making conversations around the vaccine I could imagine is for instance, divorced parents disagreeing over whether a child um, should be vaccinated and having to make that decision and both people may be having that discussion from a perspective of wanting to do what is best for the health of their child and they may have very very different ideas about what is going to be in the best interest of their child's health and so you know there's there's a wide range here and um, and I think that it's easy to imagine that when we're talking about these conversations, we're really talking about the most abstract version, the sort of like political theoretical 
conversations about um, policies that we don't even have decision-making power over. But I want to just emphasize that these, um, this presentation is meant to address all of these conversations all across the entire spectrum. And um, we recognize that it just increases the difficulty as you go. The higher um, the stakes, the more likely we are to be approaching the conversation with a real uh, desire to win the point, to actually get to make the decision that we want to make, that we believe in. But it's also, you know, the higher the stakes, if we're already in disagreement, the lower the odds that you're actually going to have the conversation fundamentally change the other person's point of view. And so, um, so even though it might feel like letting go of a, a goal of like having your way uh, doesn't make sense in these super, super high stakes um, situations, it's also just unrealistic to think that a conversation of any sort is going to shift the dynamic. So with that, I want to ask the question, when was the last time you changed your mind about a strong belief? And because this is a webinar style, I'm not asking you to um, answer aloud or to, to share your thoughts, but I do want you to really take a moment to think about the time, the last time you changed your mind about a deeply held belief. It's not easy to remember a time like that often. And a few questions, number one, what conditions, what things, what steps actually led to you changing your mind? My guess is that it wasn't one thing, that it was a lot of things coming together. And I bring this up as a sort of grounding point because often without much reflection, we enter into a conversation around vaccination um, with the intention of changing somebody's mind about a really strongly held belief. And we might even believe because we haven't stepped and really thought about it too much going into that, that that's that by the end of this conversation, we might convince them. But how often is it that we actually change our minds over something we deeply believe in one conversation? It's pretty rare. And so, if we go into a conversation with the hope that we're going to leave the conversation with the other person agreeing with us and agreeing with the decision that we want, um, we're, we're likely to be disappointed by the results. That being said, I don't want to underestimate the number of people who are just unsure, right? Like there are some people who have really deeply held beliefs about vaccination, but there are lots of people who just are too overwhelmed or have a lot of things on their plate, or they feel so pressured in many different directions that they're legitimately conflicted, legitimately unsure. And so um, that kind of person is um, also a person that you might be having a conversation with. Uh, and so we've got a spectrum of stakes for the conversations and we've got a spectrum of conversation partners who might be disagreeing with us or at least not jumping on our bandwagon. And we want to consider all of those possibilities as we enter into these conversations. So often, when we um, enter into these conversations, we, like I've been saying, want to actually influence a person. We want them to agree with us, that we want them to agree with the decision that we're advocating for. And often when we are wanting someone to agree with us, we 
um, have a few conversation tactics that we employ in order to try to win the argument or win the, um, the decision. And so, for instance, um, we will often uh, try to use data and facts to convince someone or we'll rely upon experts and authorities. We'll also sometimes try to shame a person into believing the same thing uh, that we do or making the decision that we want them to make. We'll try to um, impress upon them just how uh, damaging their point of view is to the situation. And then finally, we might really try to force the um, situation. We might try to coerce the person or uh, employ ultimatums. And all of these things can work. Um, that's why we have a tendency to fall back on them. We've, we've seen them work in certain contexts, but um, they all have downsides to them. So I want to spend some time digging into these tactics. So shame and coercion and ultimatum. So these can work. Um, they tend to work when someone identifies strongly with your group, you and your group, and they need your support. If somebody already sees themselves as sort of an outsider, to your identity, whether that's, you know, they have a different political affiliation than you, they have a different community affiliation than you, they just see themselves as really different from you. Um, shame only um, functions to distance them from you and make them, you know, more uh, firm in their belief that this, they disagree with you more firm in their disagreement. Um, but if somebody is really strongly identifying with you and they're um, and, and, and they feel like they need your support, then shame can be functional. And that's why in society we often rely on shame to try to um, reinforce certain social norms and social rules. Um, but even then it can backfire. And so I uh, really like this quote as an illustration. This book, High Conflict by Amanda Ripley, it's one of the influences of this um, particular webinar and as well the entire series. It's a really uh, good book. I, I recommend it if you have the time to, uh, to read it. A shorter article is what that influenced this uh, that she also wrote is called Complicating the Narrative. We'll send those links out with the, the follow-up email. But Amanda Ripley, the author of this book, uh, she writes that, and I have my thing blocking it, so <laughs> excuse me. So she writes, shaming is an extreme form of social rejection. It almost always makes the opponent stronger especially if someone from another group does the shaming, it cements division, bringing the other side together in fear or anger and emboldening them. And if a person identifies you uh, with you and your group and they, they need you, um, even in that case, sometimes this, uh, the experience of shame is so alienating that it actually convinces them to um, align themselves with a different group of people and a different way of seeing the world. And to feel like you, uh, to disidentify with you. And so, um, as I was saying, it can really, really backfire. The other um, thing I, I think is important um, here though to acknowledge is that we often feel a sense of moral obligation to shame people. And we feel that sense of moral obligation because we feel like, you know, somehow if we're not shaming this, this person in their point of view, 
then we are complicit in in their in their perspective and and what they are trying to advocate for if we don't shame them then we're somehow um uh endorsing their point of view and what i want to really strongly advocate for here is that you can firmly disagree with someone without shaming them and that you do not need to feel complicit in uh, their point of view just because you have failed to shame them. So the other tactic that we discussed here was coercion and ultimatums. And uh, if somebody needs your support, coercion and ultimatums can work. But again, um, that tends to degrade the relationship a lot. And um, when they cease to need you, they, it te they tend to turn against you in that particular instance. And so, um, and so it's, it's sort of a last ditch thing. Um, if you, it's not a great way to get someone to see your side of the issue. Uh, in fact, they're very likely to not see it um, and feel resentful of that perspective. So um, conversation rather than coercion is a much more long-term effective uh, tactic. Maybe less effective in the short term, but long-term it's a better approach. Okay, so then we have the ones that we, we tend to think went of when we we're thinking about persuasion, which are data and facts and expertise, experts. And this works when someone is truly unsure or undecided. And it also works when your information and sources are really aligned with their values. But oftentimes, neither of those things are true. Oftentimes, we're talking to somebody who is very um, decided and feels very sure about their perspective. And they do not feel like your information sources are aligned with their values. And so that's why um, these tactics often fail. The other thing though, is even when those two things are true, it can still backfire. And why is that? Um, or what might be going on there? Um, well, so a couple of things. One thing is that there are certain factors that correlate with more belief in a certain piece of information, regardless of its truth. And those things um, are, for instance, repetition from different sources. So you can't just repeat the same piece of information or fact and have it some, somehow um, increase the person's belief in it. They have to be hearing it from different sources. And you know, a person's community, the, the community of people that they're hearing from um, is going to affect what ideas are repeated in their presence and which ones, what information is repeated in their presence and what isn't, right? And so um, it's certainly important to share information when it's invited um, because you can be adding to the, to the voices that somebody is hearing uh, that um, advocate for a particular point of view. But if they're hearing a lot of other voices, there's very little that you can do to convince them that it's actually true. It, it, the fact that they're hearing a different kind of information frequently um, is going to undermine that, even if it's true. And then another thing is alignment with prior belief. And so if they believe something different than this piece of information, regardless of its truth, they're very unlikely to believe it. And then finally, trust in the information source, which I brought up before. Um, oftentimes, the reason why people disagree is because they're hearing from different sources of information, different communities who are repeating different kinds of facts and reinforcing different beliefs. And they have different trusted sources. And so like, what can, what can you do in the face of that? 
The other factor that is going on when we try to use information and data to, um, to convince people or experts to convince people is that um, often we do that in the form of like delivering a message and delivering a message is just another way of saying, you know, we lecture people, we tell them how it is and that doesn't work so well. So um, one of the earliest studies on this was done in 1947. Uh, so it's, it, it's definitely a dated study because um, what it was looking at was whether um, they could convince people to incorporate sweetbreads into their diet. And so there's a lovely picture of a sweetbread on a plate. And uh, so this was done in 1947 and they took two groups of people. Um, it was conducted by Kurt Lewin, who's a uh, uh, social scientist was sort of a, um, trailblazer in the field. And he um, looked at people who were, he took one group of people and gave them a lecture with all sorts of scientific information and data about the value of adding sweetbreads to your diet. And then he um, had another group of people who were given the opportunity to just sit and reflect on reasons that they think that sweetbreads might be good to add to their diet. They came up with the reasons themselves and then followed up with them to see how many had actually incorporated more sweetbreads into their diet. And only 3% of the people who were lectured actually followed through with incorporating sweetbreads into their diet, but 37% of people um, who generated their own reasons actually at least once ate sweetbreads um, in, in a way that they hadn't previously been, uh, gave it a shot. And so one of the things is that um, even when a person has no reason to disagree with the sort of underlying values of a piece of information, even when it generally speaking, might align with what they've believed in the past. Um, even in those cases, providing the information outright, delivering that message, usually doesn't work. It's a lot of wasted effort. Okay, so if that's the case, and those are, are the ways we tend to try to influence people, um, how does influence actually work? What can, what can we do to try to influence people well? Well, um, there's another source. Uh, there's a book by John Levy, You're Invited, uh, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence. And he puts together, uh, or he puts forth a formula. I mean, it's obviously not mathematical in reality, but um, I, I, I like the components of it, uh, which is the idea that influence is connection times trust to the power of your sense of community. And so when you're really trying to cultivate influence, the things that are most important to try to build are connection, trust, and sense of community. So how can you simultaneously cultivate these things and have a conversation about a topic you deeply, deeply, deeply disagree on. That's our fundamental challenge. So as I was saying earlier at the beginning of the presentation, no one changes their mind about a deeply held belief based on a 20 minute conversation with a stranger. They probably don't even do it with a tw uh, 20 minute conversation with you know, their most beloved family member, their significant other, um, or their you know, parent, they change their mind over time, over many, many conversations with different people. Um, and fundamentally, if our goal in a conversation is to leave with the other person agreeing with us, we're just unlikely to get there. But if we go back, 
to this formula and we think about the way that connection, trust, and sense of community contribute to our overall influence, we can have these conversations in ways where instead of trying to get the other person to agree with us, we try to have the conversation authentically with, uh, in a way that honors our actual beliefs, um, but that also increases connection, trust, and sense of community over the course of the conversation. So instead of trying to win the conversation, we shift to uh, trying to play the long game and think about how the, uh, the, the conversation contributes to the relationship as a whole, to the sense of connection. And our tactics change. Instead of trying to use data and information and expertise, instead of trying to um, shame someone or coerce them, provide them ultimatums, uh, instead we focus on things like listening, curiosity, common ground, and we give ourselves time. We don't get frustrated that we haven't flipped somebody's perspective in that 20 minutes or in that hour or in that day. We recognize that this is a long, long game. Now, uh, I wanna step back and admit that this is really, really hard when you are making and when you are having a conversation about a decision that you are making today or in a week, you know, if you are making a decision about whether or not to have a family gathering, whether or not to invite a particular guest, how you are going to um, engage with certain family members, it is very hard to feel like you have the ability to do these things because you feel like that decision is so critical and you want to influence that decision. That being said, how likely are any of the other tactics going to get you a change in the person's perspective on the decision? Well, and so even though it feels like you don't have the time, the reality is that still that conversation is a contributor to the long-term relationship. And so what can you do to cultivate that relationship even amidst the disagreement about the decision? How can you hold your boundaries about the decision that you want, but also hear that person's reasons for their decision? Come to a decision that maybe nobody's happy with, but in a way that honors everybody's humanity throughout the decision, that doesn't make them feel like they are um, alienated from the group or that sort of thing, like they were heard at the very, very least. Um, how can you try to sustain your relationship through that disagreement rather than allow that disagreement to be a huge source of degradation of that relationship. Now, like I said, these things are super hard and there's a lot of work that goes into making that happen. But um, the first step is actually shifting the perspective on what the goal is in the first place and making that commitment to shift the goal. Okay, so if your goal isn't to change the person's mind. If your goal, if your broad, broad goal is to sustain the relationship and prioritize the relationship, what does that look like? Well, one thing that is really, really key is to make sure that whatever your goal for the conversation is, is something that the other person would sign on for. That way you come into the conversation as partners rather than as adversaries. And so one of these things, I mean, is, is a, a phrase that 
has been uh, said many times already, prioritize the relationship. In other words, put connection ahead of your convictions, which doesn't mean dropping your convictions. It just means prioritizing the connection. And as we were talking about when we were talking about shame, empathy with a person is not endorsement. Just because you are listening and able to articulate the other person's point of view such that they feel heard and understood, that does not mean that you are endorsing their um, perspective or that you agree with it. One thing that you can really do in order to prioritize the relationship is focus on learning the unspoken story behind their beliefs. Most people really, really, really want to be understood at a fundamental level. That is a human need that we all feel. And in wanting to feel understood, most people are going to happily sign on to a conversation in which they get to share the stories that are underneath the things that they believe and the values that they have. This is a person's opportunity to be curious rather than judgmental in the conversation. And then the next piece is to seek out weaknesses in your own point of view, because we're all subject to the same cognitive biases. All of the things that um, make it so that information and data are not very functional at helping your conversation partner come to your point of view. All of those reasons why information and data don't work for them are true for you as well. And so, uh, and, you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't truth in the world. There is truth in the world, I, I, you know, but um, we're all subject to cognitive biases and you can use the conversation as an opportunity to really be seeking out those um, perspectives rather than um, trying to notice those of the other person. So there's another book um, that I think is um, a really beautiful one for this particular point. And it's called The Scout Mindset by Julia Gallif. And the scout mindset is, um, is advocating for this point of view. Um, and it uses this metaphor of how we think about our understanding of the world. And um, a lot of times, people have a perspective that they have a certain mental map of the world and the way that it works. And any information that disagrees with their mental map means that they, their mental map is wrong, that they've gotten it wrong, and that there's something wrong with their perspective, which is super threatening and really hard to, to accept. And it's why one of the many, many reasons why people really struggle with changing their point of view just based on information and facts. And so um, what she advocates for is instead a scout mindset, which is that any given mental map is inherently you know, a work in progress. And every time you learn that there's something wrong, it means that your map is getting better. It doesn't mean that your map is entirely wrong or that you need to throw out your entire worldview. It means that you're gradually honing and improving your, your mental map of your way of understanding the world. And so if you can cultivate a scout mindset in yourself, you can come into these conversations with a real desire to try to find those areas where your mental map of this issue is not quite right. It's, it's you know, so there, there's a piece where, mm, I have been, 
you know, thinking about this in a way that wasn't fully um, representative of, you know, the, the current understanding by the scientific community or by, you know, that isn't, you know, here's a source of um, hypocrisy within my own point of view and my values that I wasn't aware of. If you can use the conversation with somebody you disagree with as a way to hone your own perspective, um, I mean, that's something that most people are going to sign on for. There, more people are, you know, nervous, threatened by the idea of you know, having their own perspective attacked. But if you're coming in wanting to improve your own point of view, uh, most people will certainly be willing to partner with you on that goal and retain the relationship at the same time. Okay, but then how do you actually change their minds? Because your relationships Aren't they like a huge source of your connection? That's a huge source of your influence. So what is, your, what is the point of influence if you are not actually getting them, if you're not influencing them? Okay, so the first piece is counterintuitively, we have to let go of control in order to influence. So we have to let go of our own focus on certain outcomes in order to actually have that long-term influence. And so when you release your attachment to them making a certain decision or agreeing with a certain point of view, that person, your conversation partner, feels a greater sense of agency. They don't feel like you're trying to control them. They feel like you're in a partnership together and they feel trusted. When people feel trusted, they trust more, and so the relationship starts to grow. When you feel trusted, you also are more receptive to new ideas, and so you start to have this opening, this softening that allows you to start to influence. Your influence is unlikely to have somebody completely flip their point of view. A way that you might be able to influence them is just to get them to have a question that they didn't have before. So use curiosity as both your tool to stay engaged and focused on the relationship, but also to be a tool of influence generally, because if you can cultivate more curiosity, then that's an opening that might lead somebody to shift their point of view. At the same time, this means that you have to be open to being influenced by them. If you are not open to being influenced by them, they are unlikely to feel a sense of relationship strong enough to be influenced by you. That's hard. That's hard because it is it, it is um, threatening to your perspective and it requires vulnerability and humility. But again, um, the way to sort of tackle that can be cultivating that scout mindset. This idea that it you know your mental map is not something that has ever been right and can be disproven. It's something that you are constantly honing and working to improve. So just because you're not trying to convince them of a particular um, point of view, you still want to articulate your convictions, your values when you are invited to which you may not be. And that's one of the things that you have to accept as well, which is you cannot control the other person. You can model effective conversation. You can model curiosity. All of these things, that doesn't mean that the other person is going to meet you in the same place, particularly not in the first conversation. Sometimes you have to have faith that that might happen over the long term. So if you share your perspective as a way of the other person getting to know you better. So again, just really authentically sharing it, 
from a place of like, I want to tell you about me when that is invited, rather than let me tell you how to think like me, then um, that can be a way of actually building connection and increasing the likelihood that trust is going to develop um, between you and this person and influence will emerge over time. And then you can use the opportunity to better understand yourself and your own beliefs. So this is that scout mindset again. Um, you can use it as a chance to try to figure out how to express your thoughts as clearly as possible. This shifts misunderstandings into an opportunity. Oh, I'm learning how to better articulate my point of view, how to share it more effectively rather than, oh, this person doesn't get me, right? It's difficult to maintain that perspective, but to the extent we can, we're more likely to retain the relationship, retain the trust and influence over time. So in that book, High Conflict, um, Amanda Ripley has another quote that says, sometimes it's not just that other people don't understand us, it's that we don't understand ourselves. And I love this because arguments and conflict are often a um, really rich ground for self-reflection. And often we don't even realize what we didn't understand about ourselves until we're forced to contend with it through that conflict, through that confrontation with an idea that's really different from our own, a perspective that's really different from our own. And this is true of the conversation partner you're with too. And it can be a good way of maintaining a, an openness about their intentions. Sometimes it's not just that they don't feel like they're being understood. Sometimes it's also that they don't even fully understand themselves and they might be grappling with that self recognition through the conversation. Sometimes their frustration, their emotion is about that process of self-discovery, which can be challenging and painful and elucidating. Um, it's as much about that self-discovery process as it is about your relationship. So that's why we change our goals for these conversations. Um, but that brings us to the end of this particular presentation. Like I said, um, actually setting, committing to, and achieving these goals um, is the big challenge. It's the challenge of our lives, whether it's in a vaccine conversation or any conflict conversation that we're having. And so uh, next week, um, I actually think the date might be wrong on this one. And so we'll follow up with an email. I think that I um, mix this up, but uh, we're going to be doing setting realistic goals for vaccine conversations and practical steps to achieve those goals. Um, then uh, we have a series of, again, workshops and webinars, workshops and webinars. Um, the webinars are like this one, um, mostly an information dump. I mean, I talked about how delivering messages is not very effective. So we have the workshops where you get to experience and discover on your own and with other people. Um, and so hopefully those are even more impactful in terms of um, influence. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll follow up with more details on this. And then finally, um, time for the Q&A. So, Odd. Yeah, so my name is Odd Pleasant, the workshop coordinator for Alaska Humanities Forum. And this is a uh, six minute period that we have to answer any questions that you might have about uh, this webinar that we had today. And so if anyone wants to un unmute themselves or place a uh, question in the chat, please be my guest. Oh, and just real quick, um, it's on the screen, but just to emphasize, there may be listeners with a really wide range of perspectives on vaccination and people feel really strongly about this. So please be respectful when framing your question. Um, this is a, meant to be uh, relevant to anyone regardless of their perspective. So it looks like Ken put in the chat, I am in a conversation with someone who firmly believes that natural immunity is best. And it is difficult to get past the idea of what is better for everyone. 
Absolutely. It's super, super difficult to, um, to um, let go of the idea that if we could just convince this person um, to believe differently, and I'm sure he feels the same way about you, um, if we could just believe, uh, convince this person to believe differently, um, then we'd be in a, we, we'd be in a better place. But the, um, so, so that's difficult. The question is what is effective in actually, um, in actually long-term influencing them? And the reality is that his beliefs, just like yours, are a result of a lot of influences over the course of your life, your community, and that sort of thing. And so in order to have a greater influence within that cacophony of voices um, that are influencing him, the relationship is really core. And he needs to believe that you've really fully understood his perspective in order to be open to anything that you have to say. And he may never change his mind. I think that that's one of the core recognitions too, is that you know fundamentally this world is messy and difficult and that, um, and that in the grand scheme of things, um, there's not, but some things are, are not gonna change. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that um, there's a relationship counselor who talks about like, what would it mean to win your marriage? Um, and when you think about it, that that's absurd. You can't win a marriage. Your marriage is a partnership. And I think that community is the same way. We can't win our community. We participate in community and it often um, will involve a lot of active conflict Thank you for your question, Ken.